This is going to be a video demonstrating um, some ideas and techniques of how to use our sketchbooks to study art, to investigate it a little bit more than just staring at it. What I have here is my sketchbook. I've got a piece of artwork from an art history book, and then I have these color pencils. You can use crayons, you can use color markers, you can use pastels, whatever you have, whatever you want. And you don't have to have a whole lot of colors. So this is a David Hockney piece. I have to zoom in a little bit. One of his most famous pieces from the late 1960s. He had a very distinct style during this time of his career. So what I'm going to do is sort of divide up my page into fourths. The areas that I'm going to look at, this is going to be line, color, space, form. And then in the middle here is the other one. This is texture. This is all based on very rough, what we call thumbnail sketches. These are very small. They're rough. These are not pieces of artwork that we display in a museum, although some of the great masters have their sketches in great museums, and it's great to study those. So the first thing that I'm going to do, a line, this is basically a square, okay? And it's divided up horizontally. So what I'm doing is looking at the major lines first. So there's a major line here, major lines here that are horizontal, some verticals that are not as emphasized, diagonal going here. So this big horizon line here, there's another horizon line beyond the concrete with the building. The building is another horizontal. And then there's sort of another one for the roof line. And I think those are, and if you, sometimes you can do this, you're sort of scanning with your pencil what lines up with that. I think I pretty much have that. And then are there any major lines that are vertical? Well, there's this vertical line. There's the tree and there's another tree very close by. And then there's some verticals here for these windows. Now, any diagonals, well, the board here is a diagonal. And there, he's using some perspective because it recedes and gets closer and closer to one another. So let's want to come up here and here. And where do those go? These lines, I am finding out, do it like that. They actually crisscross right there. Interesting. This is our horizon line. Here's another line, the edge of the pool. But these lines converge on this point, where in reality, they should converge over here. So he is playing with our, our eye and with our mind. He's tricking us. And that's one of the things that we can do in art is we can play with our viewer's mind. Let me go back over this with another color. So we have that major line, that major line, that major line, major line, major line, major line. In fact, let me do a different color for those. So vertical, vertical, vertical. And here's some verticals. The diagonal, why don't we go ahead and use yellow, because it is yellow. And do that. Horizontal right there. My desk is leaning backwards, apparently. And then we have our edges, which aren't necessarily important unless it really becomes important to the whole thing. Okay, so that's line. 
and select a color. Do another quick sketch. And I'm using this to sort of plot out where things are. And that helps me study. And we have a short one and a long one. And then this comes here and that comes there. And then we have some verticals here. That's, that's all we need. Now, I'm not even putting anything for these. I forgot about that. Let's, let's use orange for the splash. We have some, some very unique curvature of lines and all there and those shapes. So here with color, I'm going to try to mimic um, as best I can. So we need a blue. Well, first we have this sky blue up here. So I'm going to bring that in. Okay. This does not have to match this exactly, but between these two blues, we've got a lighter blue and a darker blue. And then we have darker blue and I can put another layer on there to darken it up a little bit more. And then we sort of have orangey red. Um, I can I have a choice here what's going to be closer. So I think I'm going to start off with the lighter color and bring it in a little bit here and then real lightly here. But then over the brick, I'm gonna put in a little bit more, but it's real light. I'm leaving a lot of the orange showing. And then we have the yellow board, as we know is very important. And notice how this is mixing. It's not paint, but even though it's pencil, because of how our eye works, they are overlapping, thus they are visually mixing. Okay, and then we have a really dark color here for our windows. And because of our lines, we want to leave some white in between these. And then we sort of have this really light, almost yellow right there. Add a little bit of orange to it, almost like a flesh tone. Now that I have that, what I can do is come back. What I'm going to do is this process of pulling out or designating colors. So I'm going to describe that color and this color and this color. And why don't we go ahead and do this? And this is just for study. Again, I'm going to pull these out. So up here, over here, here, and here. And I'm just going to make a box for each one of those. So here, I'm going to replicate what's inside my circle here. Now, again, it does not have to be exact. My brick, I started out with a little bit of orange, a little bit of red on top of it, our dark blue. So now what I would do is use the words that are on the cheat sheet about overall polychromatic and I'm just making notes oh and it's a uh, tone is bright this is a medium blue hue value like that H V S if you want and it's blue it's uh, medium, that it's, it's somewhat of a dark blue. Put 
that in. And then for saturation, that it's vibrant. And then I would go ahead and do that for all of these, describing those colors. Again, it's just little notes for me. Again, draw out a schematic. Tree, tree. Uh, you know, something real rough like that even. That will do it. Really all I need is a line out, just an outline will do. So for space, what we're asking for is, um, is this piece of artwork two-dimensional or 3D? So it's 2D. First of all, that means everything is implied in our depth. It's not real. Okay, we can walk up there and go bump, bump, bump and see that it is canvas. It, there is no real depth to it, but it's implied depth. As we look at this for space, we're really looking at depth. How far away is the background? So since this is basically a landscape, although very abstracted and, and simplified, we would probably say that it's infinite. So depth is, and I'll do this, is infinite because it's the sky and then up close and everything in between. So I'm, for my notes, I'm just gonna use the infinity sign. However, the style is very flat. We don't see ripples. We don't see converging lines of concrete texture. Even the brick up here has no lines, but our eye perceives it as brick. So there's not a lot of texture anywhere, which we'll get to that later. But that helps with depth. So the implied depth is infinite, but it has a flat quality to it. And what technique is used? Well, we see linear perspective, overlapping the houses in front of the tree. The board is in front of the water. If we had mountains back there and they were grayish, then we'd say aerial perspective. But we do have the board converging, so it's going to be one point perspective, although it is not correct. And one more here on space is relative size, or we can just say scale, because the trees, which we know are quite tall, looks short and spindly compared to the house. We know that there's a great distance between the house and the trees. Thus, it's creating depth to our eye. So that tells us a lot about the space that's being represented. So next, what we want to do is look at form. So first thing I'm going to do, again, I'm going to do just the rough drawing. And by now, I'm actually understanding a little bit more doesn't have to be perfect. Let me get some lines here. Okay. <clears throat> so the first thing that we want to do, just like we did here, is it 2D or 3D? Is it an implied image on a flat surface or is it a real thing, a, a three-dimensional object? So this is, again, 2D. And what's its shape? So we're gonna go square. And its rough size here is 96 inches by 96 inches. So that's eight foot by eight foot. So that gives us an idea of just how big it is. It, this is a very large painting. And then for both of our either 2D or 3D, we, we do these. And it's about, first thing is the portrayal of the subject. Um, one, is there a subject? Yes. Well, it's house, pool, sky, uh, you might say trees, palms. 
something like that, just in my notes. So I'm, I'm looking into the artwork. Oh, splash, that might be important. And then we talk about the portrayal of the subject. So is it representational or non-representational? And yes, it's representational because we recognize these. So representational. Is it realistic or is it abstract? Well, it's it looks realistic, but it's not photorealistic. So it's abstract some. I'll, I'll just put it that way. And then the forms that we see, are they naturalistic, meaning they're from nature, or are they created, man-made? And the sky, there's sort of a mix. The sky is natural. Um, there's water, but it's in a pool. Um, created. Um, house. We, we could just watch created house. Um, trees. So two or three things a piece. So the pool and the house are created. Now again, my notes, it doesn't have to be pristine as long as I can interpret what I'm seeing here. And then let's talk about composition. Is it symmetrical or asymmetrical? Well, when we do a vertical line through it, it does not mimic one another side to side. So we would say that this is asymmetrical. Is it a closed form or an open form? When we look at this, that, is it really contained within itself or does it seem to be exploding out and opening up? So it's sort of a mix. The splash is open, but each of these other shapes are closed. And then we have this angle of the board jutting into it. Some people would say you have to have either open or closed. Well, if I really get pushed on it, I would say that it's closed with some open. And then we can say, is it contracting or expanding? Some other principles of design that we can go by. Um, are there directional sources? It doesn't look like there's a lot of twisting to it. Um, contrast. Uh, there's really not a lot of contrast except for the yellow and the blue right here is a lot of contrast and the white and the blue of the splash. Is there any repetition? Yeah, these, uh, I'll say this, repetition on the, ver uh, the horizontal lines. The vertical lines, there's some. But it's not emphasis. It, it, it really is not emphasized. Is there any repetition and uh, is there any rhythm? Um, we do sort of see going up. Uh, dun, dun. Uh, top to bottom is nearly symmetrical. But we have elements that are breaking that up. So we have this shape is equivalent to this shape then with this band in between. So really, if we were to break it up, let me do another little sketch here, break it up by big shapes, it's going to be our big square, the sky, pool, okay? So really, we could say, it's two rectangles, two horizontal rectangles, one above another with space in between. Okay. Um, and then our last one that we're going to look at is going to be texture right here in the middle. So again, I'm going to start out with 
image, basic trees, some of this. Okay, and then again, very rough. I don't need to have anything. I'm going to change colors because the, if I'm going to write any notes, it's going to interfere with these. Okay. So the first thing that we want to look at is, it, again, two-dimensional or three-dimensional? Is it implied or is it literal? So literal is going to be, can we really touch it like the desk here? Um, or I think we can see this. The, the tripod has texture to it that's real, that's three-dimensional. The paper here is two-dimensional. Now, if we get a microscope out, yes, we can see hills and valleys of the paper where it has a tooth to it. But let's, let's be real. And this is basically flat. And this is flat. Now, it's acrylic on canvas. We really can't see it. But what we're looking at here is it is 2D. So it's implied. So it's implied, it's representing surfaces, it's illusionary that Hockney has created spaces here that have a certain quality to them. So let's look at the actual tactile feel of the surfaces. In our mind, we see this as water, we see this as splashes, we see this as brick, we see this as concrete. Uh, the sky, the board, but how is it painted? Each of those implied surfaces have a tactile feel that Hockney has created to make us think of something that we're touching. So I'm just going to go back here again. So I'm going to look at this, the water, this, the brick, this up here, the sky, and then here in the splash. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. So here on the brick, when I look at it, now this is not my preconceived notion of what brick feels like. That's one thing that students make a mistake on. We use our preconceived idea. So I live in a brick house and I look at that within this painting, I see brick due to the color and that it's part of a structure. Now, it could be painted stainless steel, I guess, but in my mind, it looks like brick. So this brick, to me, how it is painted is flat. Okay, smooth. And there's all kinds of different words that I could say. Is it hard? Yeah, I'll say hard. Is it uh, jagged or sharp? No. Fuzzy? No. Um, cold? No. I'll, I'll say warm because it's in the sunlight and it's a pool and someone has jumped into the pool. So it's probably warm out. And then, oh, let's divide that up. So here in the sky, I'm going to say warm and dry, Southern California, summertime. So here, the water is gonna be wet, cool, because that's a cool color. My preconceived notion of, notion of water is that it's cool. So he's using a very cool color to denote cool in temperature. And then here for the splash, I'm going to say wet, refreshing. That might not be one of the normal words we use, but hey, if you come up with something like that, and cool. Okay, so is there any other word? It's soft, wet, watery, 
moist. Hey, how about eh, wet? Is it's more than just moist. Okay, so there, I'm done. So I have my lines where I could go back in here and say, uh, talk about the major lines are horizontal. Okay, those are the most emphasized. And then de-emphasized are the verticals. Okay, and there are some minor diagonals. Those are my notes. Okay, um, so I can go back and do that. So that that's it. That's my formal analysis. This is my sketchbook. This is my sketching out of my analysis. I hope this helps because normally students will be just staring at this piece of artwork, not knowing where to go. So that's why I give you the cheat sheet. That's why I give you this video. Hopefully this helps, okay? If you have any questions on this, any suggestions, I will certainly consider those. Um, this is a way that might not be true and tested for most students, but I highly recommend that you do something like this because it will bring you deeper and deeper and deeper into the artwork. And because you've done this, now you can go back and you, just start, you can start writing your paragraphs about the content. You can talk about line and go through the cheat sheet and fill in in your narrative of what line is like, because here are your notes. This is your research. You can do the same here for color. This is your research. Same here for space. This is your research and here's your research. Remember to use your blinders. Only think about line. Only think about color. Only think about space. Only think about form, texture during these times. So when you're up here looking at line, don't think about color of line. It's only those edges or those marks that have been made. Okay. All right. I think that will do it for now. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks.